in my opinion, the most consistent evidence for the most consistent effect is in the supplement of B. Oftentimes when we think of supplements, we immediately jump to high sport performance type of things or vigorous workouts or, or muscle building. Though that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, take for example, creatine. This is taken in the, you know, typically three to five grams per day of dose of creatine monohydrate, which has the most research behind it. Um, seems to be extremely low side effects in almost anyone. And the benefits include, of course, things like uh, muscle performance and strength and things like that. That said, there's excellent information and data coming out now on, on the benefits of bone mineral density in creatine. Uh, there's a ton of work looking at a host of cognitive factors um, from memory, executive function, uh, to effects potentially on even things like depression, uh, mood, to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, all forms of, of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious the brain loves creatine as a fuel. I only say that to, again, maybe expand our understanding or thinking about what these types of supplements can do. It's not just about growing muscle or, um, you know, high performance. It's everything to, again, there's an association with recovery. Uh, so creatine is fantastic for recovery from muscle, for muscle damage, uh, helps and, and can potentially aid in fat loss uh, and a whole host of things. It's not going to work as an acute response. So it's not something you're like, I feel terrible. Let me throw some creatine down the hatch. I'll feel better. That, that's not going to work. It's going to take several weeks to have a noticeable effect. It needs to be stored in tissue. Uh, it needs to be built up before you can actually do much of anything. So it is unlike some of the other things like stimulants or caffeine that have an acute you know, response right now. Uh, and so if you're going to take it, you probably need to consume it consistently. If you can't do that, then really there's no point in doing it. I also could throw in a few other of these high impact, low cost, generally safe, um, things that are my 80, 20 rule, if you will. So the way I actually kind of think about it is uh, you want one from each of three categories. Uh, and these categories are fuel, stimulant, and fatigue blockers. So creatine is actually in the fuel. It's not a stimulant. As we talked about it's a chronic effect there. So we've already knocked that one off. Uh, another one from the uh, fatigue blocker is going to be anything like beta alanine or sodium bicarbonate. A stimulant use, of course, we have anything like a beetroot juice to a caffeine or uh, something of the equivalent. So we can come back again and talk about all those in more detail uh, a little bit later. As I take a sip of my double espresso Americano here, I'd love for you to tell us about stimulants. Caffeine is the easy one to start with, and we won't belabor the point here. Uh, the evidence is strong. It has an ergogenic effect. Uh, you can take it at whatever dosage is reasonable for you. And of course, there is uh, a bit of a learning curve there, such that obviously the more you take it, the more you need to take, even though there's actually some recent evidence showing even folks who are uh, acclimated to it will still see an ergogenic benefit, even though if they don't feel a big boost of it. So typically that takes 30 to 45 minutes or so, but it's highly dependent upon the person. So some people can smell coffee and immediately feel better. And that's probably working actually through a different mechanism um, of anticipation, but you can take it there. It, the half-life of it is, you know, four to six hours or something like that. It can totally depends on the person. So don't let it ruin your sleep. But if you take it prior to performance, it has a, a noticeable effect on particularly endurance. Uh, maximum strength, maybe less, well, quite clearly less so. It appears that one to three milligrams per kilogram of body weight of caffeine taken about 30 minutes before the event starts can really enhance reaction time and power output and uh, as uh, well as, as you mentioned, endurance. When I was researching the caffeine episode, one interesting caveat that um, I discovered was that if people are not caffeine adapted, they are not regular users of caffeine, the sudden introduction of caffeine can really degrade performance, mostly because people don't know how to operate at that high level of autonomic arousal. Have you ever observed that? Yeah, 100%. In fact, once you cross the five milligram per kilogram threshold, you will start seeing performance decrements. So there's absolutely such a thing of ruining your performance with too much caffeine. If you weigh 100 kilograms, that's 220 pounds. That'd be something like two to 500 milligrams of caffeine, which is like a pretty high amount. Um, but you know, a coffee is going to get you close. An espresso is going to get you somewhat in that ballpark, depending on source and stuff. Um, so you don't really need to go and blister your brain with caffeine. And in fact, if you do, it's quite common. And in fact, likely that you'll actually make performance worse. There's actually 
another line of supplementation we can go down here, which is not technically a stimulant, but it's something I use to help performance when you don't want caffeine, specifically if you're one of those folks who have to exercise at night and you want a little bit of boost for your training, but you don't want to have caffeine because it messes up your sleep. Uh, and this is when you can turn to the whole like citrulline, arginine, nitric oxide sort of route. And nitric oxide is this wonderful compound that causes vasodilation. And of course, that's going to aid then in transporting nutrients in and out of the cell. Um, so it has an ergogenic effect. The, you have a number of ways you can go about this. In, in my opinion, the most consistent evidence for the most consistent effect is in the supplement of beetroot or beetroot juice or extract or something like that. So you can find those supplements and they tend to, uh, again, they're pretty effective at enhancing performance, specifically anything moderate to longer duration endurance performance, and they are not a stimulant, so they won't ruin your sleep that much. I'm very interested to learn from you about fatigue reducers, and I'm hoping that rhodiola rosea will come up in the conversation. Yeah, great. Let's just start right there then. There's actually a lot of research on this, despite uh, most people not having heard of it. One of the benefits that has been seen so far with rhodiola is it is helpful at managing cortisol. But cortisol suppression is not a necessarily a good thing. Um, we talked about how if you do an acute bout of stress, cortisol will go, go way up, and that is a sign of, of acute stress. However, a sign of long-term excessive stress is cortisol suppression. And so this is a, a thing to be really careful of, is if you're feeling down or lethargic or tired, and you think your adrenals are messed up, and then you start taking cortisol modulators, you could be making the problem worse, because now your cortisol is actually suppressed. And now you're taking these things to blunt it or keep it low, and, and you're, you continue to feel lethargic and, and lack of desire and libido and focus and, and sort of all these things. So cortisol is not a bad thing. Um, the difficult part with rhodiola, to be quite honest, is getting it from a high quality brand and source. It's difficult to get as a single source, which is a very, very important thing to do with supplements is try to get them sourced alone. Uh, rhodiola typically comes in combination with any other herbals or other stuff, you know, adrenal support and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also then getting them then third party certified which for most folks is not necessary, but for any athletes that need to go through drug testing systems, you should not take any supplement at all that does not have some sort of third party certification. I'm fairly sensitive to supplements, but I've started taking uh, rhodiola before workouts and found that I could push much harder, much longer through the workout. Normally I would, uh, or typically before taking it is in sessions where I did not take it, I would be able to work out very hard for 20 minutes or so. The next 10 minutes I could get some work output and then the remaining uh, period of time, it was kind of a tapering off. What I've noticed is I can complete the entire 60 minutes with, with minimal fatigue now. Within the realm of supplementation and nutrition, I'm aware of a number of things, some herbal, some lipid-based, other compounds that are used for various things, but that are known to have a potent anti-inflammatory effect things like omega-3 fatty acids, ashwagandha for its effect on cortisol, curcumin, uh, and things of that sort. Given that we want inflammation in order to trigger the adaptation response to exercise, and given that we want to reduce inflammation in the recovery period, can we put together a logical framework as to when is best to take anything anti-inflammatory, whether it's supplement-based or prescription or over-the-counter drug, and when to strictly avoid taking any anti-inflammatory supplement or behavioral tool. You mentioned ice can reduce inflammation. That's why you don't want to do it too close to exercise. The way that I think about it is understanding what we call the fitness fatigue model. So what I mean by that is whenever you do some sort of insult, the whole idea is for you to come back and get an adaptation. Now, recovery is not adaptation, right? Recovery is recovery. Adaptation is what happens after you're recovered. Right, so there's a very important distinction there. Fitness fatigue model says basically you've done something and you've got an adaptation and you've enhanced fitness. And by fitness, in this case, I mean it as a non-specific term. So you got stronger, you've uh, improved your endurance, like whatever thing you're trying to train for. At the same time though, your fatigue elevated. So what happens is if fitness increases at the same or similar rate as fatigue, your performance actually isn't any better. You may think, oh, my program isn't working. I need to then train harder. When in reality, all you really need to do is reduce fatigue. And if you do that, 
your performance will increase and all the training adaptations will be actualized. So the way that we do that is a couple of things. First and foremost is actually a taper. So the, the first step I think of if someone is training very, very hard and you're not seeing any results and we want to think about supplementation. Before I get there, I want to think about taper and deload. If you're actually training hard and sleep and everything else is taken care of. So you want to think about about a 50% reduction in training volume over the course of about a week for every eight weeks of training. So if you've been training hard for three months for something, you might want to taper for two weeks. That taper, you actually don't need to reduce intensity. Intensity is not the driver of fatigue. It tends to be volume. You can maintain. In fact, I generally would recommend maintaining frequency. So if you used to working out four days a week, keep it four days a week. You can go down a little bit in frequency, but if you go down too much in frequency, you actually tend to feel super lethargic. If you do those things correctly, you can typically see somewhere between like a three to 8% improvement in performance um, within a matter of days. Although recovery, uh, especially like injury recovery, like seems chaotic, biology is very organized and there's a very specific three-step process that you're going to go through for recovery. And then there are different supplements that can help you in each of those three areas. So area one is basically inflammation. Um, what you're trying to do is bring in fluid, enhance the size and increase blood flow in so that you can get nutrients for repair and immune cells and everything like that in the system and get the waste out. So short-term inflammation, even in the case of muscle soreness is the example we, I mean, we talked about in the previous episode, but any inflammation, it is part of the necessary process. That's why you would not want to take an anti-inflammatory in that state. And so why you also would not want to do things like an ice bath. Um, so in that immediate inflammatory response time window, this is, you know, seconds to hours after training, you would want to stay away from things like that. Um, a good option here are things like omega-3s, two to five grams total, typically like a one-to-one -one, um, EPA to DHA ratio is fine. You can also do something like 500 milligrams of curcumin three times a day. That's going to be enough uh, to keep you in a decent spot. Um, there are some other things that you could look up, um, maybe some potential benefit for ginger um, and boswellia and some things like that for inflammation. But under unless we're in like very specific circumstances where we have like an injury, um, we're probably not going to those you know areas. Step two is actually what we call proliferation. And that's kind of like the cleanup crew. That's when you're going to be going in there and cleaning out dead cells and debris and misfolded proteins and things like that. At this stage, a fantastic evidence-based supplement uh, is glutamine. Glutamine, 20 grams a day. We typically honestly split it up into two dosage, 10 grams morning, 10 grams night. It's a conditional amino acid, which means you can make it, uh, your body can make enough of it at times and other times you may want to support it. Uh, generally, those conditional times are things like burn victims, um, high stress situations or injury, things like that. So the third step in this recovery process, um, after inflammation, proliferation, we're now into remodeling. And this is when you're actually, you know, quote unquote, growing back bigger and stronger. Um, this is where the majority of the repair is actually taking place. And at this point, we're basically playing a micronutrient and macronutrient game, right? By that, I mean, we've talked about basic macronutrients. Um, one thing to pay attention to, oftentimes if people are hurt, whether they had an injury or they've had uh, just they're super sore and they are concerned about eating excess calories. They tend to want to eat less food during this process because they're like, I'm not working out so much, so I'm going to eat less calories. Well, one of the things that you have to pay attention to is injury can increase basal metabolic rate by up to 10%. Wow. So what you want to do in general is just take your calories up about 10%. At least that's what I recommend. In terms of your carbohydrate or fat split, I'm not super worried about it. My general recommendation is just don't make any major changes relative to what you were doing, right? Keep yourself uh, pretty much in the same spot. In terms of protein, this is the big one. You want to make sure you are absolutely at one gram per pound of body weight because we need those amino acids to come in and start helping um, with recovery. So that's the, the macronutrient portion of remodeling. Uh, in terms of micronutrients, to be honest, you, you just get your bases covered. Uh, this is when a basic multivitamin uh, is effective. What you're really trying to look at here are vitamin A and zinc. They actually have independent mechanisms that are helpful here. Uh, but those are typically covered in most multivitamins. So we generally just give people a multivitamin. Uh, magnesium is actually has some, some benefits here. Something like six milligrams per kilogram of body weight is the dosage you're looking for there. The only other things you would probably consider here, uh, three, 
things. Um, calcium might be on your list, particularly if you're trying to, if you're concerned with some sort of bone injury and we've sort of gone past like recovery and we're actually like into injury. Um, so you'll see that in recovery products occasionally and that's why. Uh, and then the last two ones, of course, are vitamin D and that's pretty well researched. Uh, and then the last one is actually uh, something that can help you if you're at this stage and you still are dealing with a lot of soreness uh, or not, and that is tart cherry juice. And that's actually effective for uh, both DOMS, muscle injury, muscle soreness, and actually has another benefit of potentially aiding with sleep. So uh, not a bad one to turn to as well. And there's a number of companies that make these things. Um, yeah, and then there's actually more ongoing research that I know of on those areas, but uh, promising literature, we'll say. Branch chain amino acids and essential amino acid supplementation. Yay, nay, or as I would say, meh. Uh, meh, usually. If your total protein intake is fine, then you don't really have a need for them. Um, if you're, for whatever, any number of valid reasons, total protein is not, then going to an essential amino acid would be my first step rather than a BCAA. Um, now, admittedly, we actually do use essential amino acids somewhat regularly because it's, it's also sort of like a, there's no real harm other than if you're price conscious and you're sort of like, I'm wasting money, that's fine. Does the mythical anabolic window really exist? And I'm just laughing because the way they pose the question, right. they're already telling us what their stance is. Post-exercise anabolic window is extremely real. So it is the idea that you need to, must uh, consume some sort of nutrients, specifically, usually protein uh, in some time domain, 30 or 60 minutes post-exercise in order to maximize growth. So is that window real? Yes. Are you hypersensitized to nutrients in that time frame? Yes. Is it very important that you rehydrate, uh, replenish muscle glycogen, and rebuild tissue uh, quickly after your exercise to maximize recovery? Absolutely. It's not real, though, in the sense that you, that you have to have it within 30 minutes. Um, in the case of protein, as we talked about a second ago, your total protein intake throughout the day is more important. Um, timing, though, for things like carbohydrate, especially if you're training multiple times a day, um, it is very real. So it is a very real thing. It's just you may or may not actually care about it. It may not be important for your context. Garlic seems like an appropriate question. What, if any, functional roles does garlic have in performance? You're not going to find strong human data on garlic extract. However, there is a little bit uh, suggesting it can actually enhance recovery from injury or potentially tissue damage. I'm going to ask this question for myself. Heart cherry extract. P uh, pretty effective, actually, uh, for two things, uh, potentially aiding in sleep, getting to sleep, as well as uh, muscle soreness. That's the bulk of the research is in muscle soreness and um, seems to be a moderate effect there.